Hey there, here are your disclaimers. Please enjoy. Saffron? Hmm. Briar's Bar and Grill. Earlier. Saffron taps his fingers along the edge of the steering wheel as he watches you disappear into the bar, your body illuminated by lightning as it pulses through the sky. Idly, he brings his thumb to his mouth and licks. He can still taste your blood from earlier today, fresh and sweet, like cotton candy. Wait, when did I bleed? A sharp contrast to your guarded personality. He marvels at how much a person's taste can differ from how they present themselves to the world. Those who act soft and sweet often have a rancid aftertaste, or those who parade around with vibrant personalities often end up being bland in flavor. But you, you. He winces as his teeth accidentally tear through skin, and he draws his thumb away from his mouth, studying the pearl of blood forming at his open wound. Ugh. He got carried away again. He licks it away with a quick swipe of his tongue, trying to ignore the vomit-inducing taste. Enough of this longing. Soon, he'll have vials of your blood to mix with his liquor, plenty to drink and savor for years to come if he preserves them long enough. Not to mention the delicious meat he'll pair it with. He just needs to remain patient. Is Saffron a cannibal? Is, is that what I'm getting at here? Saffron busies himself by looking at his phone and going over a cake schedule. He shuffled around a lot due to Adam's unforeseen injury, which leaves most of their week open. Perfect, considering the amount of cleanup this will take. Adam informed him of your un being a probable casualty, but since, he since she's such a recluse, it's unlikely anybody will notice her missing for quite some time. They can make a few payments here and bribes there in order to keep suspicion off of them. Still... It would have been so much easier had Adam done what he set out to do earlier. Everything was planned accordingly, not a flaw in place. So what happened out there that allowed you to escape? Yeah, we were, uh, are we still in Saffron's uh, point of view? Oh, yesterday evening, Dower Hotel. Saffron stepped inside the hotel's elevator and presses a button for the main floor, adjusting the cuffs of his button-down shirt as he waits for the doors to close. Damn. No matter how many times he gets his clothes tailored, they never seem to fit him just right. I, I can tell, like, they, they seem really snug on him, and I, I love it. I absolutely love it. It's not like he's hit a growth spurt. He's far beyond his prepubescent years, where changing height and lengthening limbs were a problem. No, it's another matter entirely. Saffron sighs and forces himself to stop fiddling with his attire, accepting defeat yet again, when a young man with short, cropped hair joins him. He smells faintly of lavender and honeysuckle. Yesterday, it was rosemary and mint. He glances at the man's hands, slight Hints of dirt caked underneath his cuticles, nails cut to the quick. Saffron smiles as his fingers hover above the elevator buttons. Floor? The man offers up a quiet, subdued smile of his own, mouse-like in nature. Lobby, please. Same as me, then, he says and hits the button. That in itself is a lie. He has nowhere to go, at least not until he's to retrieve Adam and help dispose of the body. No, he's here for him. The cute and timid gardener boy who stares at the ground wherever he goes, even on his way to the little florist shop that he works at a few blocks down. Saffron bought a bouquet of meaningless daffodils in order to engage in even a slight conversation with the young man. And what he discovered underneath that demure, soft-spoken act was an inquisitive mind. One that Saffron was ravenous to get to know on a deeper level. Uh, Saffron? What are you gonna do with the gardener? Saffron turns towards the young man, 
about to engage in polite conversation when his cell phone begins to ring, classical music flooding the small space. He smiles at the young man. Please, excuse me. The young man holds up his hands, and Saffron catches the sight of a band-aid wrapped around his thumb. Oh no, you're fine. Don't mind me. So considerate. Saffron has to dig his nails into his phone to keep his composure. Patience, Saffron. You'll scare him off. He's made that mistake many times before. Acting over eager and asking them to dine with him, only for them to stand him up. But he's learned and adapted, and soon he'll have this man on a silver platter. He'll make sure of it. Saffron answers the call with a firm, Hello? There's heavy breathing on the other end, followed by a curse and a gr- Adam? What? Frick. Saffron frowns, worry zipping through him in an instant, but it forces himself to remain composed. Playing the part of a concerned parent will only serve to aggravate Adam. What happened? Adam hisses through his teeth, and Saffron hears the sounds of heavy footsteps. They got away. Saffron blanches until the words register. They what? Did he hear him right? But no one's escaped Adam. No one. So how? Adam answers, as if knowing exactly what's on Saffron's mind. They managed to catch me off guard before stabbing me with my own knife. They got in their car and sped off. Another grunt, then under his breath. I'm going to kill them! Saffron rubs the bridge of his nose as the elevator dings and the doors open, signaling they've reached the lobby. The young blonde steps out without a moment's hesitation, and any chance Saffron had for inviting him out to dinner is now ruined. He really hoped today was the day. But until they take care of you, he'll need to take a rain check. All right, I'm coming to pick you up. Stay where you are. Adam doesn't answer and instead hangs up. A moment later, Saffron gets a text for Adam's coordinates. He's about a mile off from where he dropped him off last. Saffron pockets his phone and locates the rental car before hopping in and setting off for Adam's location. He better be okay. I guess we're back in current day? Yesterday, abandoned highway. Never mind! Saffron finds Adam crouched down near the side of the road, using his turtleneck to soak up the blood pouring from his wound. The same one you left behind. Saffron's hands flex around the steering wheel as Adam hauls himself into the passenger side, wishing they were circling your neck instead, taking the life you tried to steal from Adam. How dare you touch him? How dare you leave him bleeding out? You almost ruined everything. You're lucky Adam didn't die, or you'd face a fate far worse than Adam could ever give you. Slow, tortuous. Your body chained to his dissection table, squirming and flailing about, screaming your vocal cords raw in a massive symphony of emotion and terror, quelled only by your following. Saffron? Saffron snaps out of his fantasy with stark clarity, startled by how visceral his own emotions are. His hands loosen around the steering wheel, and he blinks in a daze. Oh, what an unusual reaction. He's never felt such indescribable hatred, and rarely does he think about using such unnecessary violence, preferring to use tools rather than his bare hands on an individual. Perhaps seeing Adam hurt awoke the parental side of him. He does care about the band members, after all. He tucks it away for later, to give a proper dissection. I apologize. Could you repeat that? I'm afraid I missed what you said. Adam's jaw ticks as he wipes away the faint sheen of sweat gathering above his brow, but he's far more subdued than usual, and his words lack their usual bite. Did you bring sutures? I'm bleeding out here if you hadn't noticed. Saffron tuts as he reaches into the back seat and retrieves a small white medical kit, 
He hands it over to Adam. Thanks. A dry response, and one that lacks genuine gratitude. Saffron can't help but smile as Adam pulls out the needle and begins sewing his skin back together. Always with the cross language, this one. At least he gets to see the real Adam. Most people in their lives will never know the cruel being lurking underneath his modest persona. Never know how many bodies left in Adam's wake that Saffron took the liberty of cleaning up. They'll never experience such a pleasure because they would never understand it. They call him a monster, drag him into the electric chair for their version of justice, despite the fact Adam stands for the very same thing they do, working to eliminate the sinners posed as saints. He just doesn't mind having a little fun before snuffing out their miserable existence, and no one will ever find out. Not unless Saffron starts the car. Not unless you reveal their secret. No, everything will turn out fine. He shouldn't think about the worst-case scenario. And besides, you're just one measly little piece of livestock who managed to escape the packaging plant. You operate the same as most people. You'll slip up at some point because you're in a panic state, and those who let their feelings overwhelm them tend to make plenty of mistakes that both he and Adam can take advantage of. There's just one thing nagging at him. Adam almost always executed his plans with flawless precision. So what did you do in order to catch him off guard? Adam won't answer outright, be sure. It's something Saffron himself will have to piece together. Not that he doesn't mind a good puzzle from time to time. It keeps him sharp. Stop, Adam says, pausing mid-stitch to look at Saffron. I can tell what you're thinking. Just leave it alone. I have no idea what you're referring to. You know exactly what I mean. Is there a reason you're so desperate to hide it? Is there a reason you're being so annoyingly persistent about it? Saffron sighs, reining in his frustration. Getting mad at Adam won't help and will further him from his goal. He tries again. I understand your discomfort, but I wouldn't if it weren't so important. Someone got the upper hand on you. What if they manage to do it a second time? What if they kill you, or worse? I can't let that happen, Adam. I won't allow it. Adam's quiet for a moment. When Saffron's eyes skirt over to see what's causing such a long pause, he catches the other man touching his lips while wearing a slight frown on his face. Saffron notices for the first time. They're swollen. It won't happen, Adam says at last. His fingertips trail from his lips over to the ever-present earring. It glints under the glow of the sunlight as if even God approves of whatever decision he's come to. It won't happen because I won't let it. Saffron withholds a shudder as Adam's gaze cuts over to him. Not out of fear, but in delight of a hunt that will end in a satisfying conclusion for the both of them. Because if anything, Adam's just as hungry of a monster as he is. Briar's Bar and Grill, earlier. Saffron trusts Adam's decision to redeem himself. From the way Adam spoke, whatever you did to him was unforgivable, and Saffron knows it's not just because you stabbed him. No, it's something much deeper, more complicated. Like you somehow shook the very foundation of his being. How you did it, Saffron doesn't know, but either way, Adam will eliminate you without mercy. Because on the off chance he doesn't, Saffron's eyes flicker towards the glove compartment box. He reaches over and pops it open, revealing a hidden revolver nestled between slips of paperwork and traces the cylinder with great affection, his gaze returning to the bar where you disappeared into. Adam gets ten minutes to redeem himself once we get back to the trailer park. Saffron promises himself 
as you exit the building in a rush. He closes the glove compartment and tightens his grip around the steering wheel. Otherwise, I go in. Yay! <laughs> it's Adam's turn. Roof's trailer. Earlier. Adam hovers above the collapsed form of your aunt. Shards of glass lay scattered around her body like broken teeth, blood splattered across their surface in cruel arches. He nudges her limp wrist with the toe of his boot, having questioned, through all of her incessant begging and pleading, how much more pathetic this woman could get. Turns out, by quite a lot. I told you not to run. Now look at you. I've got to make a mess of things. Ruth doesn't respond. Not that Adam expects her to. She hits her head pretty hard on the corner of the kitchen table when she tripped over her own two feet in her haste to get away. He'd hoped to pry information out of her once he finished you off. Things only she might know. Things that could lead him to achieving his ultimate goal and the promise he made to her. But of course not. Because no one in your family can listen for five freaking seconds! Adam sighs, scrubbing a tired hand through his hair as he takes in the miserable scene when something in your aunt's grasp captures his attention. When did she... He bends down, keeping a careful distance from your aunt in case she's hiding one of the glass shards in a free hand, waiting for an opportunity to strike that will never come because he's all too familiar with the same tricks from his previous victims. He picks up the photograph tucked beneath her palm. The photo she kept hidden in her drawer. The one she was so desperate to protect. He takes note of the cracks on the glass fissuring outward, starting at the edge of the frame and slicing through Ruth's younger self, splitting her apart in a twisted sort of irony. His gaze drifts over each of the five women until he lands on the one with wavy brown hair, a shy laughter concealed behind her hand. He almost forgot what it sounded like. Almost forgot the warmth and vibrancy after all these years. He can hear it now. Adam swallows hard and flips the frame over, undoing the back, letting the foam board fall to the ground with a dull thump before pulling out the picture itself. He peers over the newly freed photo, sparing another glance to your aunt. His expression hardens with hatred. She looks a little more like her younger self like this, her hair loose from this scuffle, her arms spread like angel wings. But nothing about this woman is angelic. I'll be taking this, Adam says before stuffing the picture into his wallet for safekeeping. If he can't get any information out of her, he reasons he'll just try using another resource like this photo instead. Maybe even you might know something, considering your connection to Ruth. Some secret she could have spilled without you realizing their significance. Don't take it back. Adam catches the sound of a small, desperate whisper. He peers down at your Aunt Ruth and cocks his head to the side, almost mocking. Oh? Are you still alive? She doesn't say anything, but he notices a flicker of movement from her hand. The same one he took the photo from. Huh. Stubborn and resilient. Just like you. Well, at least he can still glean answers from her and put an end to her miserable existence in the worst way possible. One he deems fit. He knows just the perfect ending for a woman like her. Adam lowers himself again right as she makes a croaking sound, unable to distinguish what she's trying to convey. She's just garbling nonsense at this point. But he has all the time in the world. So he'll play along the same way he did with you on that highway. He enjoys playing with his food 
as much as the next serial killer. What's wrong? Adam asks with mock concern, his tone sugary sweet with a bitter aftertaste. What? You want your precious little picture back? He waves the empty frame before tossing the empty fixture towards her. The frame lands right beside her immobile arm. Her finger twitches in response. Adam's voice dips, lowering with malice. Do you really think you'll need that where you're going? She doesn't respond, leaving Adam to wonder if she passed out again or died on him. Adam scoffs. You know, you're really bad at holding a conversation. Again, he gets nothing out of her. How disappointing. Adam's burner phone buzzes and he glances at the message sent by Saffron. They're almost here. Adam smirks and pockets his phone, his body humming with anticipation. Showtime, he says, and tries heading for the door when he feels a hand dart out and wrap around his ankle, the grip weak but persistent. Nails dig into the fabric of his jeans. Give, give it back. Adam pauses, staring down at her hand, invading his freaking personal space, taking in a poor attempt at stopping him with cold detachment. And if I don't, you'll what? Kill me? He reaches down and detaches her fingers one by one, focusing on uncurling them before he gives in to his primal urge. He wants to wring her neck, to twist and snap her bones, watching as the life drains out of her. He wants her to suffer, to suffer just as much as she did. This bitch is the entire reason he can't stand liars. Adam, I don't know if you remember me. Of course he does. After all, how could he forget? Is this right now? Or is this in the past? It's in the past, I guess. Screaming. Screaming. So much screaming. He covers his ears, closes his eyes, and tries to escape through his mind and thoughts but they're all twisted together like a hastily wrapped ball of yarn. There's a thump followed by a crash from somewhere downstairs, probably in the kitchen. Why? Because it's always the stupid kitchen. The angry cacophony of curses and shouts reverberates through the closed bathroom door where Adam hides. He didn't want to stay downstairs in his room. Not when things are like this. He's afraid to get pulled into the fray. You keep making a fool out of me! Another crash and the sound of glass breaking. Adam ducks his head as if words are physical objects that are easily hurled and someone just chucks them at his face. Stop it. Just stop it. He shakes his head as tears stream down his cheeks. Please, just... Up, But it keeps going and going, getting worse and worse, making him sob harder and harder to a point where he's afraid someone will overhear. He can't get caught crying again. Not after last time. He can still remember the acrid scent of cigarette smoke and the suffocating darkness of the shed, his palms flat against the rotting floor as he waited with his head bowed. No, he's learned his lesson too many times to count. So he curls in on himself, trying to control his breathing and stifles the sounds of his anguish with his trembling hands. You look so much like your father. Adam still remembers the cruel expression on the woman's face as she said it. The muffled giggles and concealed laughter that followed. The hand on his shoulders tightening at the comment, drawing him away from the open stairs and into one of the empty seats. I can't believe I didn't see it before. You look so much like him! He wanted to scream, 
to deny anything that linked them together. I'm not him. I'm not him. I'm not him. I'm not. I'll never forgive you. The guttural scream makes him jump, then tremble in fear. He hates this. Hates that woman for causing it. Why? Why did Miss Aspen say that? And why did it cause all of this? He can't comprehend the meaning behind any of it and doesn't know if he ever will. He remains there for what feels like hours, arms and legs getting numb from being stuck in the same position for so long, terrified of making any noise that draws attention. Then everything just stops. An uneasy quiet fills the house and Adam shivers. He wiggles his toes, trying to regain feeling in them, listening out for the chaos to pick up again. It doesn't, and that's much, much worse. Feet shuffle up the staircase, and Adam squeezes his eyes closed. I'm not here. I'm not here. I'm not here. The door to his bathroom slams open, and Adam jerks upright as the lights flare to life. His bottom lip trembles as he looks to the door. Adam. The hell happened? Ruth's trailer. Current time. Adam. Adam gets thrust back into the present, and the sight of the woman at his feet makes his lips curl in disgust. She repeats herself. Uh, um, yeah, back. No, he's never forgotten her. Not even for a moment. He lifts Ruth by her wrist, dangling her in the air so that they're face to face, their noses almost touching while she hangs there, limp. Are you really... In a position to make demands because from where i'm standing i think you should shut up and wait until i'm done with that nasty little relative of yours but sure keep testing my patience see where that gets you glad we see eye to eye adam lowers her but keeps a hold of her wrist to keep her filthy blood-stained hands off of him He's gonna need a blistering hot shower after this. Whereas your touch ignites deep-seated want, hers feel like a thousand maggots crawling all over his skin, burrowing their way into his insides and eating away at his entrails. He'll hold on to this disgust while dealing with you, because he can't let you get close again. He won't let you. Adam composed himself when light floods through the shattered window of the small, darkened trailer. He watches as a car pulls up, followed by Saffron's reefer truck. He must have brought it in preparation for the massacre that's about to happen. Despite this, Adam can already hear Saffron complaining about the fact you'll take up room, your body's filling up space in his precious freezer, unwanted unless he gets desperate. Saffron's a choosy guy, an irony not lost on Adam considering the man's diet. The flower boy will live another day. For now, Adam hears the crunch of your sneakers over the gravel, followed by a knock at the door. He reaches for the abundance of chains, taking his time undoing each one to send your heart thumping and your mind racing. He can almost feel your trepidation leaking through the door. You're scared, aren't you? Click. Well, you should be. Click. Because he's been waiting. Click. Click. God damn, they didn't need to go that hard. Roof's trailer. Current time. I finally found you, 
my elusive little pest. Adam, your mouth goes dry at sight of the purple-haired demon in the flesh. And how does he greet you? With a goddamn knife! You try looking down at the aforementioned knife without moving your neck. Otherwise, you'll impale yourself like a shish kebab and notice it's covered in dry blood. Did he seriously not at the very least clean the thing? And who does it belong to? You? Or someone else? Your eyes wander over to your aunt who lays motionless on the ground a few feet away from where you crash landed after Adam jump scared you. It's yours, he says, reading your mind. Your aunt did that with no real effort on my part. Right. And he's also just a hurt, misunderstood soul who just needs lots of hugs and unconditional love to fix all of his baggage and deep-seated issues. Because if you learned anything, a smooch a day keeps the serial killer at bay. Okay, sarcasm aside, the last part's a little bit true. <laughs> Kissing the killer ultimately did save your life when you were neck deep in trouble and helped you avoid getting skewered. But even so, you're not buying his bull. The man lies as easily as he breathes. He's a repeat offender, considering none of his general audience knows he murders people for shits and giggles. Or at least, that's what you assume. It's either that or for a power trip, quite possibly both considering how Adam's personality flip-flops between cocky and aggressive. Why else target complete strangers? You contemplate this as you try adjusting the angle of your neck in order to put some much-needed space between you and Adam's weapon of choice. Well, that and to check if your aunt's still alive. But Adam pursues you, giving you no wiggle room to work with, and he rewards your efforts by giving you a soft warning prick Eyes on me. You wince at the stinging sensation before fixing him with a glare. Oh, yeah. You forgot about his issues with personal space. Consider your bubble pop for the rest of your interactions because you are not getting it back with him around. Your earlier fear goes up in a puff of smoke, annoyance taking over the mantle instead. I'd say go screw yourself, but after recalling our kiss from yesterday, I doubt you know how. Adam's jaw ticks at the comment. Oh yeah, buddy. Feel the salt in the wound. Oh, sorry. Too soon? You say, in mock embarrassment, winding your eyes to establish that you aren't sorry in the slightest, going straight for his weak point in retaliation since he went after yours. As sucky as Aunt Rufus... You're not letting her die for your poor decisions. Adam's your burden. Your cross to bear. You should have killed him when he had the chance, but you didn't. He won't make the mistake again. Not when you're armed with your own weapon, tucked into the waistband of your pants. You never learn, do you? Adam says, withdrawing his blade. Right before it descends on your already weakened shoulder. You screw your eyes shut and turn your head. Unable to duck out of the way with Adam boxing you in. You wait for the inevitable pain of knife tearing through skin and muscle, flashing back to that horrific moment on the highway when you try contacting emergency services, your body readying itself when... Thunk. Nothing comes. Just a condescending chuckle from Adam when you open your eyes to find the knife embedded into the wall above your shoulder. My guy! to need to fix that! Unproof is useless! His eyes glitter with amusement over your reaction. Great. So he's gone from outright stabbing to psychological torture. Exactly what you need. So much bravado. And yet you're still afraid of me. That's good. Adam whispers, his breath warm in your ear as he leans close. You should be. He repositions his knife at the hollow of your throat when he draws back, reaching into his back pocket with his free hand. 
I've got a few questions for you since your dear aunt couldn't bother to answer them herself. You raise an eyebrow at him. Oh yeah, because an unconscious man, I mean an unconscious woman, can totally help. Forgive my aunt for her poor manners. I'm sure she's so sorry for that, despite all the trauma you put her through. You jolt upon feeling the knife move, a subtle shift that leaves you, wondering if you pushed him too far when you feel the steel travel downward instead. Adam's unamused by your jeering. You're stretching his patience. But for some reason, he's not hurting or killing you. In part, you're relieved, but you also question why. How many times? Adam asks, pushing aside the collar of your shirt with the tip of his knife to reveal a mess of gauze and medical tape underneath. Do I have to remind you what I'm capable of when you've already experienced it? Are you really that stupid? My clients say it's part of my charm. An odd expression consumes Adam's face at the mention of your clientele, but you blink and it's gone replaced by his usual skull, whenever you dare to open your mouth. He finally pulls out whatever's in his pocket, a thin slip of paper, and unfolds the parchment. He presents you with a picture of your aunt and four other women. Now tell me, do you recognize any other women aside from your aunt? You open your mouth, prepared to fire off another quip, but Adam flips the knife and angles it towards your juggler. You swallow hard. Uh, uh. Uh -huh. Adam taps the picture against the seam of your lips. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Otherwise, my hand might slip, so I suggest. A cocky little smirk tugs at the corner of his mouth. You choose your words wisely. Damn, you really don't have much of a choice but to comply. Fine then, you'll remain complacent. For now. You take your time studying the photo, when something about the woman positioned at the far left of the group with her petal pink dress and delicate frame captures your attention. While the rest of the women laugh openly, hers convey a distinct shyness, almost as if she doesn't want the others to notice. Yet, that's not what bothers you. It's the fact that you do recognize her. But how? You examine each of her features, poring over each minute detail in order to figure out where you remember those Cupid's bow lips and high cheekbones from. She's modeled pretty, distinguishable within any crowd, much like the rest of her friends. Birds of a feather flock together, you think, and notice how her arms aren't linked with the others. Until the cat comes. Adam wraps her finger along the top of the photo. Tick tock. We're running out of time. You don't even bother glancing up. Hold your knife, kink horses! I'm trying to concentrate! Then hurry up! The hand containing the photo darts out and grips the back of your neck, forcing you to meet his gaze. The sharp press of his blade goes to the underside of your jaw. His legs are wedged between yours, one on either side, his knees pressed against the inside of your thigh as he kneels before you, purple tips of his hair tickling your cheek. Yeah. He's that close. His proximity makes your heart pound, and not the, oh my god, he's so dreamy sort of way, but in the, oh my god, he's gonna gut you like a fish sort of way. You weigh your options, deliberating on headbutting him, but decide against it due to the sharp obstacle blocking your way. He's not underestimating you this time. Adam refuses to give you any ample opportunities to take advantage of his weakness. The knife isn't just there as a threat but a barrier. You know I can't see the photograph at this angle, right? You've looked at it long enough. Now tell me! He lowers his head, those pitch black eyes flashing red, his mouth stretching into a snarl. What do you know? You frown as you study the movements of his lips. Then a light clicks on in your head and you start connecting the dots. The high cheekbones, the cupid's bow lips, right down to her wavy hair. Those features are a perfect match for the man right in front of you. You blurt out the words before you can stop them. Holy shit! Why didn't I realize earlier? You look so much like her! Adam. 
goes. Absolutely still. His pallor turns chalk white, his expression a mixed cocktail of emotions, ranging from angry to haunted to tortured, all in the span of a few minutes. What did you just say? He's shaking so hard, you feel yourself vibrate thanks to your close proximity. The knife disappears from your throat, and you know it's now or never because you won't find a better opening than the one presented to you. You don't know what triggered him, and you don't care. All you know is that your hands are reaching for the kitchen knife at your waist, driven by the instinct to kill him for everything that he's done and going to do. Only one of you will walk out of here alive. You'll make sure it's you. Adam's lost in a daze when you bring your arms up in a wide arch. To which Adam dodges a moment too late, the front of his hoodie tearing in the process, blitz spraying against the trailer walls. You try going for his black hole of a heart next, but Adam springs away from you. In a flash, he's at your aunt's side and your knife spears through empty air, lodging into the musty carpet flooring as you bring it down. You give the knife a harsh yank before getting to your feet. The picture Adam used to interrogate you with flutters to the floor like a flag being dropped to signal the start of a match. Ding ding! Adam presses a hand to his chest before drawing it away to reveal blood smeared on his palm. I hope that hurts you, butthole, because there's more where that came from. You're practically spitting in his direction, geared up for a fight after all the hell he's put you through for the past two days, unrelenting in his pursuit. You're going to give this guy a taste of his own goddamn medicine. Adam's slow to look up. His eyes are narrowed, but to your surprise, He's smiling, teeth bared, like he plans on using them to rip you apart. It's primal, that smile, like he's been waiting for this moment his entire life. Like he's been waiting for a reason to finally end this. Cute, Adam says, his voice dipping low as he gives an expert flip of his knife before catching it by the hilt with trained precision. He points the tip of the blade in your direction, but I promise... I'm better. And quick, as he whips on you, like a beast released from his cage, a snarl ripping from his throat, he tries slashing at your arm wielding the kitchen knife. You manage to pull back in time and hear the whistle of metal slicing through air, your knife cradle against your chest as you hit a wall. Adam descends on you. You try your best to keep him at bay, but you're an amateur in comparison to his seasoned practice a fact that becomes crystal clear within seconds. He forces you to go on the defensive while he goes full offense, his attacks jarring and harsh, force you to block one after the other in favor of lashing out again. Each blow chips at your already dwindling strength. Your injured shoulder burns from exertion. You can't keep up at this rate. Everything aches, the pain echoing bone deep, causing your movements to become slow and clumsy. You're getting tired, worn down, but Adam is not. If anything, he's invigorated by your struggle to keep up, as if he's soaking up your fear to help fuel his bloodlust. There's a knowing smirk at the corner of his lips. He knows you're delaying the inevitable. His endurance will outlast yours, and once you falter, he's going in for the kill, like a snake constricting a mouse until its body folds. We both know he's got the advantage here. The odds are stacked against you. They were right from the beginning, and you made the mistake of pulling over. There's got to be a way out of this. You grit your teeth, sweat dripping down from your brow and along the curve of your spine as you try to fight back, try to find an opening. You won't find one, Adam taunts, guessing your train of thought yet again. Why don't you just give in to me? We both know you won't last much longer. He substantiates his point with another rough jab of his blade. Your teeth rattle from the impact, and you almost lose your grip on your knife, but you manage to remain firm. If anything, you're stubborn. A trait he couldn't beat out of you even if he tried. Oh, come on now! You say with a huff. Now you're making... Now you're making the sex jokes way too easy! You gasp as his knife comes down harder than ever before in retaliation to your pre-obvious jab, the steel pinging with his furious blows. 
Is that really all you think about? But well, sometimes! Adam says, clearly seething. Oh, he's cranky now. A fact you'd take pure delight in if he didn't say what he says next. Considering how you kissed me and after finding about that online job of yours, I... Your entire body goes cold. How'd you know about my job? You wear a mask to conceal your identity. Not out of shame, but for privacy reasons. How does he know what you do for a living? No, you guess you shouldn't be surprised. He's a stalker after all. And you don't doubt he dug into your background. Probably at some point after you gave him the slip. I have a better question. He let out a help as he manages to grab hold of your wrists while you're processing this new information. You lose your grip on the knife and Adam kicks it away, shoving your one method of defense somewhere behind him with a scuffed boot before pinning your arm over your head. You raise your other arm to fight him off, but he grabs that one just as easily. It joins the first, both now pinned underneath his grasp. You lift your leg up to kick him, but he uses his body to restrain yours, your hips perfectly aligned. The knife returns to your throat, and you stop struggling. Great. Back to square one. Tell me something. Adam peers down at you, with a harsh sense of judgment. Why did you kiss me, back then, on the highway? Why was that your first instinct? Is it because of your goddamn fixation on sex? You could have fought me, gone for my eyes, punched me, anything but shoving your tongue down my throat. So why? Why did you do it? You bark out a harsh laugh, devoid of humor. That's what he's focusing on? This? Right now, of all things? But you're starting to piece everything together. You guess that accounts for something. For someone who accused me of thinking about sex all the time, that question is pretty hypocritical. I'm starting to think it's you who is obsessed with sex, and now you're just projecting. It would explain a lot. What? You say with mock concern, as his mouth twists into a skull. You say with mock concern, as his mouth twists into a skull. Are you frustrated because you can't stop thinking about it? Thinking about me? Is that why you get upset whenever I bring the topic up? Because you want me? The air goes thick, heavy with unspoken tension as your words hang there, in between you two. You hear the pitter-patter of rain against the trailer roof, the rest of the world going quiet as if anticipating Adam's response, wondering what he'll do next. Whatever it is, you're ready. Ant Roof! Roof's trailer. Current time. Roof's mind fractures, splits apart, then gets reassembled once again before the cycle repeats. She hears a muffled argument, her ears stuffed with what feels like cotton, unable to decipher the string of conversation or figure out whose voice belongs to who. Glass cuts into Roof's cheeks, arms, and legs. It hurts. Everything hurts. She's disoriented, unable to remember how she got acquainted with the floor. What Roof does remember, and the only thing she can seem to remember, is the man taunting her with the face of the woman she once cared for. With the face of a first la- Wait, what? How cruel. Roof reaches for the photo, the only picture she has of her first love, because if she's going to die, she wants to die by her side. That's all she can ask for. Her hands fumble over the shards of glass, but finds the space beside her empty. Then another memory clicks into place. Adam taking her away. Adam shoving the photo into his pocket, mocking her feeble attempts to get her back. Adam. The hellspawn birthed from the hips of an angel. A monster in the making, just like that bastard, the one who took what she couldn't have, telling her that her love was a sin, that it was vile, and she wanted to prove him wrong. Wrong, 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 and now she's gone. These men keep taking her love away from her. Adam and that bastard both. Ruth sees on the ground, her fists 
clenching when she sees something glittering from an arm's length away. Like a present. Like a gift from God. Ruth reaches out and wraps her fingers around the handle of the forgotten kitchen knife. Oh no! Adam, you're in trouble! Is that why you get upset whenever I bring the topic up? Because you want me? The words hit Adam like a freight train. As soon as they pour out of your mouth, a violent clash of flesh and metal, his head spinning on impact. What are you implying? Denial surfaces in his brain, something most people do upon confrontation, and Adam's no different. You're wrong. He doesn't want you. He'll never want you. But Adam knows he's lying to himself because of the excuses he makes just to touch you, reasoning that he's only using his body to trap you and not because he wants to get close enough to feel your body heat. <laughs> To feel you. I am so sorry. I know that this is supposed to be serious. And you know, maybe it's supposed to be hot. I don't know. Okay, I don't know. I am very much ace. But... <laughs> oh my god. Just the fact that secretly he's just so down bad. It's just... Oh, it's just sending me. Holy frick. Yes. He wants you. God, he wants you. His dream self-admitted as much, and the thought disturbs him. It makes him sick having these feelings. He needs to kill you, and yet he's acting like a kitten, seeking warmth for the first time. You're flush against him. Your body is without a centimeter of space between them, and all he wants to do is lift you up and... <laughs> no. Adam crushes the thought without mercy. Whatever he's feeling, this blatant and unwelcome desire, he couldn't give in to this particular sin. He made a promise. He vowed never to give in. You're a temptation. One he's desperate to overcome. You're the hardest obstacle he's ever faced. One many would say the devil put in his path to lead him astray. But Adam wonders if regular people are the real devils. He's almost certain you are. His own little devil, meant to seduce him away from his original purpose. But he won't. He can't. You break the silence, your voice alluring as a siren's to a ship captain. Why are you so quiet? Not even gonna deny it? You raise a brow at him, and it's like a rebuttal, like you can read his thoughts and see the war raging behind his eyes. His lips curl into a snarl. Don't you do that. Don't you freaking dare look at him like that. Like you've got him figured out. Adam presses the knife deeper into your skin. So that it's almost cutting into your neck. And you wince despite the fact he purposefully didn't break skin. One more push though. And there'll be blood. Plenty of it. Your chest heaves against his in response to the unspoken threat. He's breathing heavier too. He convinces himself it's because you're afraid, and that he loves your fear, and that's why he's breathing so hard, and not because of the friction of your chest against his. His lust for blood always outweighed his attraction towards other people. So why shouldn't it work now? Answering one question with another. How very like you. I seem to recall a certain someone whimpering against my mouth, unable to restrain himself. Are you telling me that was a different serial killer? I wouldn't be surprised considering you kissed me, a complete stranger. Nasty habit you got there, kissing dangerous men. Do you do that often? If so, maybe I should cut it out of you, starting from here. He taps your chin with the tip of his blade before guiding it down your front. Shifting his body to allow, to allow the knife to glide towards the top of your navel as if he's tracing lines on a map. To here. As your expression hardens, he smirks and realigns your bodies, returning the curve of his blade to your throat. How does that sound? I'll gut you properly so the pain will only be a little agonizing. We can take it nice and slow. You raise an eyebrow at Adam. 
Okay, now it just sounds like you're trying to flirt with me, and it's getting a little sad. Sorry, Adam, but you're not my type. I mean, I like men who don't stab me upon first meeting. It's called having standards. Adam's lip curls into a snarl. If that's how you see this, then you're delusional. His nails dig at your wrist, and you bite your lip to keep from crying out. He ignores the way his body throbs. He's throbbing? Why is he throbbing? P please tell me that this is actually the sound of, like, my heartbeat and not the sound of his... Of him throbbing? Please, please, for the love of God. How do you keep forgetting? I almost killed you the last time, and I'm capable of far worse because I've done worse. Make that of... Make that of what you will, but... There is nothing about you that will keep you safe from me. You're deluding yourself into a narrative that you've built based on one experience. Then say it. Or better yet, go through with it. You challenge, not backing down. Because as far as I can tell, you've had plenty of opportunities to torture the answers you want out of me. And yet you haven't even cut me once. Why is that, Adam? You stabbed me as soon as you got the chance when we first met. So why aren't you doing it now? Why are there only threats and none of your previous violence? In fact, I'm starting to miss the violence. Like, come on. You gesture over to your aunt with your chin. You did it to her, so why not me? Come on, Adam. Tick tock. You quote him from earlier. Adam's gaze narrows. He spoiled you too much by not following through with his threats. He'll have to change that. Are you sure you're in any position to push me? Do you think I'm not capable of hurting you anymore? That I can't kill you because I get what I want out of you? Because I beg to defer. He presses his forehead against yours, forcing you to look into his eyes. Do you see his resolve and burning hatred for what you awoke in it? Wait, wait, wait! What did I awaken in him? What did I awaken in him? Then beg, you say, with zero hesitation, lifting your chin, holding his gaze like you're his equal. Because even with this, your eyes go up to gesture towards your foreheads before locking on Adam's face once more. You're just finding excuses to touch me. I know what attraction looks like, Adam. I've seen it with my clients. See it in my everyday life of what happens when a man wants someone and you match the entire definition. Why are you so afraid to admit it? Scared I'll use it against you just like last time? Afraid you like it too much? Your body shifts against his, and Adam whips hold a groan, grinding his teeth to cover up the winds that follows. Too late. He sees you've already caught on. He needs to prove you wrong. That your body isn't his ultimate weakness, and he's not someone pathetic enough to be controlled by sexual desire. He's not your clients. He's not like any of them. And he'll show all of you here and now. Adam withdraws his blade, rises it high above his head, and says, Wrong move. Before bringing the knife down. Okay. Outside in the van. Current time. He counts down the minutes ticking by. Five. Then four. Then three. At two, Saffron pulls out his gun and loads three bullets into the chamber. He glances up at the trailer he's parked in front of. One more minute. And he's going in. Um! I, um, I don't... I, um, Adam, could you hurry it up? Adam, please! Roof's trailer. Current time. Adam's knife comes down, and you brace yourself for the familiar sensation of steel tearing through flesh and blood, knowing the futility of fighting but trying anyway. You thought you had Adam pegged, that you had him all figured out. Wait, wait, I was pegging Adam. Wait, is that something I can do? Can I peg Adam? I, I want to peg Adam. Can I, pe can I please peg Adam? <laughs> I don't know if this video has already gotten demonetized or not, but Jesus Christ, I want to peg Adam. <laughs> you thought you understood why he hesitated, but you didn't. And now, are you going to pay the ultimate price? And there's nothing you can do to stop it. Chest puffed? Stay strong. 
You grab onto your old friend's phrase like a lifeline. Keep your gaze locked with Adams in one final act of defiance, willing the hatred in your eyes to haunt him for the rest of his days. It was you who couldn't escape him in life, but in death, you're determined to return the favor tenfold. You curse him until the day he dies. You don't even bother to keep track of the blade as it plummets towards the chest in an act of sheer stubborn willpower, refusing to show any signs of weakness. At least, even through all of this, you can take consolation in the fact that he never was able to break you. That you maintained some sort of dignity, even in the end. You clench your fists, you jut out your chest, and you hold your head up high like you're above this, above him. Adam notices the subtle change in your demeanor, his eyes whining in surprise, as though he expected for you to crack and start begging for mercy. The knife comes down and stops. Right? Above your heart. Adam's breathing hard, his hands shaking with visible frustration, unable to tear himself away from your captive gaze. He tries again. Adam raises his arm, brings the knife down, and the invisible chain that stopped him the first time around stop him yet again, something holding him back, something giving him pause, and he fights tooth and nail to deliver on his promise. Adam's gaze flickers down to his traitorous hands, the same ones that refused to give in to his commands before returning to look at you. Adam's jaw clenches, his molars grinding. You're surprised he doesn't chip a tooth in the process. Damn it! Adam hurls the knife away, the steel embedding itself perfectly into the wall parallel from where he threw it. God damn you! God damn you! Adam's hand encircles your throat as he slams you into the wall. You claw at his fingers, his arms, his chest. You're losing oxygen. Fast. Your vision turns black at the corners. Spots dip in and out of your peripheral like glittering stars. Harder, Adam! Harder! You can feel him shaking again, this time for an entirely different re- Um, 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 for what? What reason? Why is he shaking? Do, 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 do I want to know why he's vibrating? You can feel how desperate he is to kill you, to escape the humiliation of his attraction towards you. He's acting like a wild animal, trapped and afraid. Tears prick at the corners of his eyes, and you witness something genuine and raw rise to the surface. Vulnerability. Why did you have to appear? Why? Are you here to torture me? To screw at me? To break me? His voice cracks and fissures as his hands tighten and constrict, a war rampaging behind those darkened eyes. He's battling the deep-seated truth of your words. I don't want to feel like this. I don't want to feel any of this. I need it to stop. I need you to stop. I am begging you to just stop. Why? Couldn't you have just done it like everyone else? Why did you have to kiss me? His hands give one last squeeze and then they're gone. That was pathetic! Carter Adam, put those hands on my throat again! Come on! I dare you! I dare you! Are you just too much of a wuss to do this? Are you too much of a wuss to properly choke me like the star you are? Come on! I thought you were my superstar, Adam! Harder! Come on! You take in a, sm a much needed lungful of air, coughing and sputtering as you collapse against the wall. You try to catch your breath. When Adam's face grows near. What is he? The question dies in your throat. As soon as you see the intent behind Adam's eyes, his lips parted as his warm breath brushes against your skin, his expression tortured, as though he knows what he's about to do will ruin him. You hear a scraping sound coming from above. His nails. They're clawing their way down the wall in a last feeble attempt to restrain himself from giving in. I... Hate that. I want you. His voice is barely above a whisper before his mouth descends upon yours. Your head spins from his quick and sun transition, and you don't even have time to shove him away, his lips almost brushing yours, but not quite when. Give her. Ba 
back! Someone roars from behind Adam, as all of a sudden, his body jerks forward, his back bending at the impact of an unseen blow as something slams into him. There's a sickening, wet thump, followed by a gross squelching sound. Adam grunts through clenched teeth. Give her back! Give her back! Give her back! Give her back! Another thump follows the first before Adam growls and sweeps his arm out, sending the person behind him, your Aunt Ruth, flying across the room. She collides with the wall before slumping to the floor. Ruth blinks, momentarily stunned. In her hands, she wields a knife, drenched in crimson. The same one Adam kicked away moments before. When Adam turns his back to you, focusing all of his attention to your aunt, you spot two fresh wounds near Adam's shoulder blades in near-identical slits. They remind you of what's left behind when a fallen angel gets stripped of their wings. Adam sways like a drunken man. He braces his hands against the wall, nails torn and bleeding from when he clawed at it earlier to keep himself from kissing you. Right. He almost kissed you. Voluntarily. Looks like your blossoming theory was right on the money. Not that that's something to celebrate. You'd rather your milkshakes not bring all the serial killers to the yard. Least of all, Adam. You shake your head to clear your mind. Nope, nope, nope. Maybe someday you can unpack this stuff in therapy, when you can, you know, afford it to figure out why your milkshakes bring all of the serial killers to you. Hey, hey, don't call me out like that, okay? I just, I, 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 I have a need. I just have a very feral need, okay? For right now, you've got bigger fish to fry. Namely, the aforementioned serial killer who looks like he's about ready to pounce on your aunt roof and strangle her to death. Or worse, I should have killed you, and I had the chance. Adam rasps, stumbling towards her with uneven steps. Your aunt gets back to her feet, grasping onto the counter for support, and you freeze upon seeing the unabashed rage pulsating off of her in thick weight. I'm afraid of my aunt. Well, I've, I, I, do, I do have reasons to be afraid of her, but uh, <laughs> oh, who's going to win? I'm pretty sure it's Saffron, because he's got a gun. He, She directs everything she has at Adam, all of her ugliest emotions laid bare. You've never related to her more. Ruth's lips peel back into a snarl. Her lips stayed red, as though she applied too much makeup, the storm rampaging outside, her eyes overshadowing the monsoon going on outside. She looks unstable, insane, broken. She spits her vitriol at Adam, her words containing a venom that poisons each syllable. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. I'll kill you for everything you've done, you sick, twisted little bastard. How dare you? How dare you wear her face and do this to me? How dare you taunt me this way? How dare you? Tears fall from her hardened eyes, but she scrubs them away with a rough jerk of her wrist. I'll end this. I'll end you. Adam staggers again, but he gives a low chuckle devoid of humor as he rips his knife from where it juts out of the wall. His own hatred rivals your aunt's. Funny, he says, using the sleeve of his hoodie to wipe your crusted blood off of his knife in one quick swipe. Because a long time ago, you told me I looked just like him. Was that another one of your lies? Or did you know what would happen if you said something like that? Ruth bows her head. Well, did you? Come on, Miss Aspen. Tell the truth for once in your miserable life. Yeah. Fault. Adam tilted his head in an animalistic way of his, a hunter listening for prey out in the long stalks of grass. What was that? Speak up. I can't hear. It's your fault she's gone! Your aunt screams in a raw outburst of emotion. Glass shots dig into her heel as she gives an angry stomp of her foot. You recoil at the sheer volume. What's going on? They're almost acting like they know each other from somewhere. Like they have some sort of shared past together. This isn't just about Adam breaking into her trailer and attacking her, but rather another matter entirely. Something that caused your aunt Ruth to dive into the depths of madness and come out swinging. It's like they have an unresolved grudge from before you ever entered the picture. Wait. The picture Adam showed you before. Ruth and that woman that looks like Adam were both in it. 
Did something happen between them? Your mind swirls with the possibilities of what all this could mean as Ruth continues. You're the reason she endured everything she did. It was all for you, and yet you killed her. Your entire existence destroyed her. I told her. Aunt Ruth says between frantic gasps, nearly sobbing. I told her. She shouldn't have gone through with the pregnancy, but she wouldn't listen. Ruth clutches her own chest, as if preparing herself to tear out her own heart in order to spare herself from the painful burn of the memory she is uprooting. Adam remains quiet, but his knuckles turn white. He's gripping the hilt of his knife too hard. Whatever she's saying, it's affecting him too. What he did to her. You know that all started because of you, don't you? But she never told you that because she wouldn't want you to blame yourself. But you should have. You watch with mounting horror as Ruth's feet leave behind bloody tracks as she steps over the glass, daring to get closer to Adam. He remains eerily silent as she gets at his face and jabs at his chest. And now? Now she's gone because of you! You took her away! You took her away! You goddamn piece of crap! You took her away again! She's breathing hard as she reaches the end of a crazed rant. Adam's absolutely still. For a moment, no one moves. You're not even sure any of you are breathing. Then, there's a lightning strike, and the room becomes illuminated in a yellowish glow that shows Adam lifting his head. And all hell breaks loose. Adam's on your aunt in an instant, because even while he's wounded, he's fast. He grabs a finger, and you hear the sickening crack of bones breaking, like a twig being snapped in two. Your aunt screams and flails, her knife managing to cut into Adam's cheek, but he remains unperturbed and instead disarms her by severing the tendons in her fingers. She loses the grip on her knife, and Adam's other arm darts out, wrapping a hand around her throat. Then he's lifting her into the air. A cold-blooded killer once more. Her legs flail and kick, her fists thumping against his arms as her feet leave the ground. You scream your aunt's name and search for something to stop him. He won't let him kill her. You need to act. Now. Um. 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 Um, I'm gonna save this. I'm pretty sure killing him would uh what a freak I know, but I don't I I'll kill don't, don't distract him kill distract I distract him I will distract him You grab a skillet from the kitchen counter in favor of going for the knife currently laying in front of Adam's feet. You aim high and slam the metal against the back of his head. Adam lets out a strangled noise and releases your aunt in the process, sending her tumbling to the floor. Ruth scrambles to get away from him. Her attempt to flee halted, but her back hits the mattress inside of her bedroom, and her eyes dot towards the small nightstand with a single drawer. Adam cradles the back of his head with a hand, and he spins on the heel of his boot. He looks like he's about ready to inflict the same punishment he did to Ruth onto you, but then recognition clicks. You can see the conflict in his eyes. The hesitation. But you're already on him, because you don't share the same qualms. You drop the skillet and finally go for the kitchen knife, seeing your opportunity and bring your arm in an upward slice. You cut through his fingers, not enough to sever them, but enough for him to lose the grip on the handle of his own weapon, and you hear the satisfying clang of metal hitting the floor. He drops to the ground in order to dodge his second follow-up attack. Adam cradles his wounded hand and looks back up to you, towering over him, knowing full well that you intend to put an end to this. That you intend to put an end. To him. You raise your knife in order to deal the final blow, while trying to prep yourself for the guilt that probably comes from taking a human life, but knowing it needs to happen when. Ah! Frick! I forgot about him! Pain blooms and spread, like poison ivy crawling up the side of a house. You blink in complete and utter confusion. What was that? Just now. You look up from where Adam is crouched and notice your aunt standing in her bedroom doorway. She's got a gun in her possession, with the drawer open beside her. When she lowers her weapon, you can see her face turning ashen, her eyes going wide like saucers, her gnarled fingers trembling. She mouths something you can't quite make out. You blink again. What happened to your hearing? Was it the bang? Did it somehow burst your eardrums? You try raising your arm, but they hang limply at your sides, 
refusing to respond. You notice Adam staring up at you while on his knees, his own face mirroring Aunt Ruth's horrified expression, which almost makes you laugh because you feel a little lightheaded and not quite right for some reason. They were just trying to kill each other. Why the sun pause? Your legs buckle and you almost lose your balance. Oh, that was weird. And damn, why do your sides hurt? You reach down towards your hip in an effort to seek out the source of your growing pain when you feel your entire side coated in something wet and sticky. From where your fingers drift, there's a small hole torn into the fabric of your shirt. It's small and circular in shape, almost like... Oh! Just as your brain connects the dots, your other leg gives out and you become weightless as you fall towards the floor, your body's ecosystem finally registering the bullet's presence. An arm cushions the back of your head before it connects with the ground. Ooh! Darkness encroaches, but you see Adam's blurry form drift over yours. You recognize that damn purple hair anywhere by now. For some reason, he's yelling and shaking you by the shoulders. Hey! Hey! Don't close your eyes! His voice dips in and out, and you can't make heads or tails of what he's saying. But you don't really care, because right now, you feel so tired. Your eyelids are getting heavy, with the strain of staying awake. You're so exhausted. So very exhausted. Her eyes begin to shut as you feel the pull of eternal sleep. You begin to let yourself go, because in doing so, you feel no stress, or pain, or fear, or any of the ugly things that come with existence. Just blissful silence. Adam calls out to you again, but you don't respond. You let the darkness take you instead. What the hell are truths? Adam propels himself forward on instinct and catches you mid-fall. Hey! Hey! Your eyelashes flutter and... Oh, God, there's a lot of blood! It tries shaking you to keep you awake, but you're fading and you're fading fast. The sight of you so weak and defenseless agitates him. Why the hell do you think you get off? You survived him and yet one bullet to the lower abdomen is too much for you to overcome? You, you're really gonna fall to friendly fire? There's no way in hell you're getting out of this that easily. He's not done with you. Do you get that? He's not done with you yet, God damn it! Don't close your eyes. You hear me? Don't close your eyes! Your breathing slows as the lower half of your shirt becomes soaked in red. You're not listening to him. You're not listening to him. And your eyes close, and no matter what he does, they refuse to open. Frick. Adam snarls and rips off his hoodie, tearing at the cotton sleeves in order to help staunch the constant flow of blood, cradling your limp body in his arms while he hopelessly tends to the wound. You're going to die. You're going to die, and there's nothing he can do. When he closes his eyes, a memory flickers like a candle wick, one of murky red water and the drip of a bathroom sink, and... No. He doesn't care if he needs to drag you from the depths of hell, kicking and screaming, so long as you live. He'll bring you back by force if he has to. He's not letting you go. Wake up! Do you hear me? Wake! There's the click of a gun and Adam feels something metallic get pressed into his temple, cutting him off. His eyes snap over to Roof, who stands above him, gun in hand, with her finger on the trigger, ready to blow his brains out at a moment's notice. She doesn't even bother looking in your direction or separating you two. Where's Saffron now? She's not here to help you. She's here to kill him. The photo. Where is it? You've got some screwed up priorities with your flesh and blood lying here. She pistol whips him and he grunts. The gun drills into his temple upon return. Where did you take her? This greedy, selfish bitch of a woman. Violent thoughts stir in his head. He imagines himself snatching the gun out of her hands, wrapping her hair around in his fist as he bashes her head onto the nearest horizontal surface he can find before he... Roof pistol whips him again, harder this time. Adam hisses and glares up at her, frustrated that he can't play out any of his twisted fantasies in reality. At least, not yet. Answer me! Where did you take her? Where? 
my back pocket, check inside my wallet, is telling the truth. To an extent, her beloved picture is probably lying on the ground somewhere. It's too dark for her to see. Her eyes not yet adjusted to the severe lack of lighting. It provides Adam with a fantastic advantage. Ruth takes his word at face value, exactly as planned. And when she reaches for his back pocket and searches for her precious photo, he brings his arm up and wrenches Ruth's wrist backwards, another gunshot going off as Ruth pulls the trigger, this bullet hitting the roof instead of its intended target for the second time in a row. She won't get a third chance. Ruth shrieks as Adam wrenches her hand back, positioning the muzzle of her gun underneath her jaw. Looks like I have the advantage again. He curls his finger over the trigger. Ruth thrashes this way and that, but Adam's stronger than her. Too strong for her to have any hope of crawling her way out of the mess she made. But that doesn't work. She begins sobbing. What? Does she think he'll let her go if she cries hard enough? That she's someone worth pitying? The idea is so funny, it's almost laughable. She seems to sense his lack of empathy because she becomes bitter in the next instant, cycling through a rainbow of emotions, her shrieks rattling the kitchen cupboards. You don't get it! You don't get it! I loved her! I really loved her! And you... You took her from me! You and that bastard both! Adam pushes the muzzle of the gun upward, digging it deeper into her jaw, causing her to finally shut up. He's sick of this woman. Same! Same! I couldn't give less of a shit. Adam says before finally pulling the trigger. Adam blinks. Nothing ha- You only had two bullets, and Ruth? You only had two bullets when you are that bad of a shot? What do you mean, Aunt Ruth? He tries again. Click, click. Then, realization hits. The gun's freaking empty. Did she seriously waste all of her bullets? God! Ruth brings her head back and rams his skull against Adam's, forcing him to let go of his grip on both her and the gun. While he's recovering from the blow, Ruth descends on the kitchen knife before raising it high above her head, giving Adam a weird sense of deja vu when he did the same thing moments before, and brings it down right as the front door slams. Finally he's here! When the front door slams open, an arm extends from the entrance and... Freaking finally, Saffron! For once, I'm actually rooting for you! Ruth sways for a moment, staring down at Adam in a silent accusation before crumbling to the ground like a marionette with its strings cut. She lands face first into the glass shards, a gaping hole just an inch above her ear leaking ichor. Adam already knows that she's dead. Shot not once, but sorry. What? Wait, why? Okay, okay, okay. Uh, it seems even Saffron wasted all his bullets, but at least he got his target. At least he got it done. The arm in possession of the gun that killed Roof disappears before Saffron fully steps into the trailer. His slacks, vest, and button up cling to his body due to the rain. Even his hair, usually slicked back for a sense of professionalism, is disheveled. He cocks his gun again as he looks at Adam. Adam sees the question sitting at the tip of his tongue. You alright? Saffron knows better. Instead, he gestures towards Ruth's corpse and your unconscious form. What happened here? Adam ignores Saffron in favor of returning to your side, checking for a pulse. There. A heartbeat. It's faint, but there. Adam gathers you up and into his arms as a confirmation of your survival. In spite of his injuries, that throb in complaint. He turns to Saffron, quietly observes the whole interaction. There's a faint crease between his brows, his displeasure obvious and tangible. Adam knows of Saffron's prying nature, knows that he's bubbling over with questions, but refrains from asking them because getting a straightforward answer out of Adam is tricky in certain circumstances. But that doesn't mean he approves of what he's seeing. Adam, however, could, couldn't give two craps about what Saffron's thinking. Saffron? Adam says, his voice sharp like a command. Saffron looks up at Adam, albeit reluctantly, and he continues. There's a photo lying somewhere on the floor. I want you to grab it alongside Ruth and bring them both to the truck. 
We're leaving, he says, and brushes past his manager, who remains stationed inside the doorway. Adam's almost halfway down the steps, her body becoming drenched from the bulk of the storm, and Saffron's hand clamps down on his shoulder. Adam doesn't even bother turning around. Let's go. His voice is quiet, deadly. A serpent in the grass, hissing at the hungry wolf. A monster, baring his fangs at the other beast who dared challenge it. Just tell me why you're bringing them with us, Saffron says. What do you want with them? Give me one good reason why and I'll drop the matter entirely. Adam looks down at you, your expression calm and serene in your unconscious state. You look sweet, gentle, innocent. But Adam's well aware you're nothing of the sort. You distract him from his initial purpose, his ultimate goal, leading him to damn near cave in to his son desires. And he almost did, didn't he? Why did you kiss me? Adam shakes his head, disgusted. A stupid, illogical question, made on impulse, with the heat of your body surging against his, one that cost him greatly because he no longer has Ruth, the singular person connected to his past. Yeah, it's unfortunate. He no longer has her, but... Adam? Saffron urges and Adam gazes down at your unconscious figure, resolute in his decision. He no longer has Ruth. But he still has you. Despite the fact that you're a liability, you're his only other option right now. And because of that, he needs you. He's not keeping you around because he wants you. You're simply a necessity. Yes, Adam thinks with growing conviction. He needs you. That's all. Adam finally manages to shrug Saffron off. Remember what I told you when we first met? Adam asks recalling the memory of pink-tinted water spilling over the lip of the bathroom tub, the water sloshing against his torn sneakers as he stood there with mounting horror. Tears streamed down from his sore face. Of course. There's a sense of underlying pity in Saffron's tone that Adam loathes, but he refrains from drawing attention to it. Instead, he slowly pivots towards Saffron, the tip of his purple hair, whipping around him as a large gust of wind hits the trailer park with sudden furiosity. The cross earring cuts into his cheek. A small punishment from the previous owner, be sure. I need them in order to complete my promise. Adam says at last, his eyes flashing red as he lets the agony from the age-old memory consume him. I promise to her. Okay. What does that mean? Saffron's office, current time. Saffron stares out at the near desolate landscape from his balcony doors, his arms folded behind his back as he relishes in the rare quiet of the sprawling hills. This place exists high up in the mountains, a perfect place to avoid getting caught on camera surveillance. Out here, no one will bother investigating the blood curdling screams or the growing stench of the woman rotting in the back of his reefer truck. Well, not that she's rotting per se, but she smells absolutely vile. At least to him. But that's probably due to his lack of interest in her. You, on the other hand, smell absolutely delectable. Even with your festering shoulder wound at the beginning stages of an infection. He had to stop himself from lunging for you while you lay unconscious in the passenger seat of the truck with Adam, tending to your injuries in an effort to keep you alive. Saffron nearly gave in to the urge of pulling over and devouring you whole. He fantasizes about tearing strips of flesh off your bone. He thought about what sauces and seasonings to pair you with. He salivated at the prospect of lopping off just a finger or toe as an appetizer. He came so close to giving in to the ever-present hunger, but refrained due to Adam's insistence that he needs you. Or at least, that's what Adam claims. Saffron suspects something more. He's never seen Adam get so possessive about a target before, going as far to smack Saffron's hand away when he reached out for you in order to keep the strain off of Adam's wounds. It's like Adam wants you for himself, for whatever reason. And Saffron feels... disappointed. Cheated. Because they made a deal. He gets the bodies of the dead and damned after Adam eliminated them. 
That's the agreement. As a result, Adam doesn't need to worry about the details of getting rid of some pesky evidence or a body, and Saffron can divulge in his own sadistic pleasures without doing any of the dirty work. It's a mutually beneficial transaction. And now, Adam's changing the rules of the game and making up mundane excuses as to why Saffron can't have you yet. It's frustrating. Saffron realizes he's gnawing at the skin of his thumb, a nasty habit he really needs to get rid of, and wipes the saliva off with a square piece of tissue paper. The urge to taste you is unbearable. It's borderline torture. Saffron sighs and folds himself into the plush desk chair in an effort to calm himself down. He's not mad at Adam, but frustrated with his decision as of late. Because like it or not, they're affecting him too. He needed to reschedule everything after the injury Adam sustained during your shared encounter, and now he's unable to hunt the gardener boy because your aunt's going to take up room in his freezer. He wanted something out of this whole debacle. You were an equally appealing prospect, so he felt satisfied. Now, with neither you or the gardener boy, he's ravenous. A little speck of your blood is not enough. He needs more. Saffron's hand bends out against his desk, his fingers brushing against something. Oh? The picture. His eyes fall on her, and he feels the monster subside in an instant. Remember what I told you when we first met? Adam had said, and Saffron did. And Adam is as sincere now as he was back then. So why is Saffron thinking such ludicrous thoughts? How shameful. Saffron places the picture into his desk drawer and chastises himself from letting himself get so worked up over a piece of meat, putting his own needs above Adam's for unjustifiable reasons. Adam does what needs doing. He doesn't complicate matters unless warranted. He should trust Adam. Perhaps. He's imagining things. Yeah, that's right. He just jumped to conclusions. Once Adam's done with you, he's sure the boy will follow through. He's not anchored down by mundane feelings like most people. It'll all work out. But what if it doesn't? A tiny thought argues his inner doubt. But if you're right, maybe you should take care of them yourself, just in case. No, stop it. Saffron swats the thoughts away, waving his hands as though they're a fly buzzing around his head. But he's gnawing on his thumb again. Saffron's pocket buzzes. Someone's calling him. Perhaps the venue management over there is some cancellation? He looks at a caller ID. His heart skips a beat. Why is he calling? And why now of all times? Did he see something on the news about what took place at the trailer park? Is it about him? About Adam? Call yourself Saffron. You don't know until you answer. So Saffron clicks the green button and presses the phone to his ear, putting on his best everything is great performance. So nice of you to call. To what do I owe the pleasure? Saffron exhales the caller's name. God. What the frick? So that was you and him. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. If you guys do want to play this for yourselves, the link to the game will be in the description below. Um... God is in this game? I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know what to make of this. I honestly don't know what to make of this. But um, I did enjoy it. I did enjoy the story. I think um, I think the developer actually went really hard on the story. I absolutely loved every moment of it. It was so thrilling. And honestly, I wish I had more games that actually thrilled me the way you and him did. But anyway, thank you all so much for watching. Hope you all have a lovely rest of the day. And as always, I'll be seeing you in the next video. This is Lion, signing off. Ciao.